Okay, thanks for coming. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor John Duber from UC Berkeley. So he received the, his BS degree in biochemistry from University of Delaware, and he had his PhD degree with Professor Wendell Lim at UCSF, and he was a QB3 distinguished fellow at UC Berkeley with uh, Jay Kiesling. So he worked with a very famous person before. And he joined uh, UC Berkeley in the Department of Bioengineering in 2000. And he also joined uh, EBI at the time, 2010, sorry. Oh, sorry, 2010. And he's going to talk about strategies for controlling and improving flux through engineered metabolic pathways. Please. Thank you, Young Su, for the introduction. Can everybody hear me in the back? Uh, so, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's been a lot of fun getting to see the the other half of of EBI here in your natural habitat. Uh, it's really something with a lot of really exciting things going on. Hopefully, I'll get to visit more often. So I thought I'd uh, share a couple or two or three stories uh, that my lab is working on that are all centered on this theme of trying to make technologies that improve engineered metabolic pathways. So as this audience is probably well aware, uh, there often are quite a few problems that arise when engineering uh, pathways into a production host. I've outlined uh, some of the ones that we think about in the lab. Uh, so this here is supposed to de designate uh, in blue a heterologous pathway that we've engineered into the cell. We're siphoning off some of the uh, flux from central metabolism here. And you can get intermediates that will undergo side reactions. You can have allosteric regulation from intermediates onto your enzymes that you're engineering or vice versa. Intermediates that can cause toxicity to the cell since the cell hasn't evolved to see these uh, intermediates or certainly not the accumulations, the high concentrations of these intermediates. And then sometimes we also see loss of, it, of carbon through cell secretion of intermediates. And in general, we're also worried about a, the problem of expressing too much of these proteins because they can be a burden to the cell that has to produce them. So all these are problems we would like to deal with uh, through engineering solutions. So the outline for the talk, first I'm going to talk about a uh, work that, uh, that many of you in EBI are familiar with uh, some of what we've done through common total expression engineering, trying to get the right balance of concentration of each enzyme in these multi-enzyme pathways. And then I'll go on to a story where we're trying to take a spatial approach in compartmentalizing our reactions to improve their efficiency and hopefully eventually change the environment of that compartment to do new chemistry you can't do in the bulk solution of the cell. So with common total expression engineering, I was just going to express the multi-enzyme pathway. You can imagine it would be nice to be able to dial in the concentration of each of those individual enzymes. Uh, also, we're not necessarily always aware, and I think this is usually the case, of what the production landscape is going to be for that pathway. We don't know where these peaks are, where to target. So we like to take a common toil approach, since we're bad at this prediction, just make lots of guesses. So that doesn't get here by the number of, high number of red dots. And then empirically determine where that uh, top, top uh, peak is. And in doing so, we'd also like to, do, to learn about the design of the pathway. So we'd like to learn as much about this landscape as possible so we know where to go in with further engineering, uh, engineering principles to iron out those problems and get closer to the optimum. We'd also like to facilitate the ability to optimize new fermentation conditions uh, that will be be able to allow us to further improve these pathways. So we'd like to optimize, but also like to learn about our pathway as we're doing this step. And we decide to start with a common problem for uh, the EBI, and that's xylose utilization. And when I think about the 
these metabolic pathways, I like to think about them as a pipeline, where each individual enzyme can be thought of as a single pipe with a different cross-sectional area. And you can see that in this pipeline, uh, thinking about its catalytic efficiency here, related by the width of the pipe, you have some enzymes that are much more rate limiting than other enzymes. So you can imagine that you probably will want to have higher expression of these rate limiting enzymes. Although a caveat to this is we really don't know much about this enzymology for different conditions, growth conditions, different strains, et cetera. So we'd like to, uh, to do in vivo testing under these different conditions. To do this, we decided we'd also like to include the entire pathway to go from silo through to pyruvate. And that, that has eight enzymes that we a priori expected to have an influence over flux. So we'd like to have different expression level control of each of these eight enzymes, uh, and we decide to do this on a plasmid system using a CENR, so trying to be as close to single copy uh, per cell like it would be in the chromosome as possible, and, uh, and in a two plasmid system where we can break up the pathway to the upstream part that's heterologous to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, XR, XDH, and XK. And then the downstream part of the pathway, shown here in gold and green, would be the pentose phosphate pathway and the glycolytic enzyme pyruvate kinase, which has, uh, uh, there's some evidence in the literature before we start this that that might also be a rate limiting step. So our thought for this is, although Cerevisiae so naturally has these enzymes, it hasn't evolved to be a high flux pathway. So we might need extra copies of these enzymes. So we included that in our total library. To gain expression level control, we moved to a transcription control system where we use five different promoters that are constitutionally active and show very little, uh, little stochasticity or noise. You see the air bars in both directions are quite small. And these promoters vary over roughly three orders of magnitude. So we get a nice transcriptional range of expression. And they fall along a diagonal line when you plot these promoters driving expression of YFP fluorescence or RFP fluorescence. So it seems like they are not too sensitive to what the identity of sequence is that they're driving. We further tested this by putting behind each of these promoters a uh, start codon and then 24 bases, their NNK repeats, and then our four fluorescent protein, and picked eight random colonies from this library. So they should vary in sequence in this upstream region, and then tested how the expression of each of these mutants looks. And you can see the color coding the same as on the left, that we see the same general step, that the strongest promoter in red is always the highest, then orange, then green, then blue, then purple, for all of these, with the one exception of strain eight, which actually has a stop code on there. So that's why we're not getting expression there. But for all the others, you see the same step. So it's the same rank ordering. So if you have the strongest promoter, you know you're getting higher expression than if you have the next strongest, et cetera. So in our strategy, we uh, made, a, made this library with five different promoters for eight genes and put those on two plasmids. And then we did an enrichment strategy where we transform into a BY yeast strain, so a laboratory strain. We grow for about one doubling on glucose for the initial shock, uh, which ends up being about a short overnight step. Then we wash and inoculate in xylose media, 2% synthetic, uh, synthetic xylose media, and then do multiple enrichments where periodically we can take out some of those strains and uh, genotype what they're promoter gene combinations are. We developed a strategy for rapidly and cheaply determining 
the identity of the promoter that's driving each of our genes, borrowing from a PCR TACMAN approach, where we designed a, promote, a probe, algo probe, for each of our five promoters, so five probes, each one with a non-overlapping fluorophore, and then a quencher. So the way this works is we use uh, the probe. If that promo specific promoter is present, its, it's respective probe will bind to it. Then with TAC, PCR, with primers, uh, standard primers upstream and downstream of that promoter, the TAC uh, polymerase with its 5 prime to S3 prime exonuclease activity will chew up those uh, DNA probes and release the fluorophore from its quencher, and you'll get a fluorescent signal. So in this case, we get green fluorescence, which would mean we have, I believe it's RPL18B promoter driving it. So that allows us to rapidly genotype what promoters in front of each gene for a number of strains in our library. So remember, we've done enrich we do enrichment, and then periodically we can take out uh, some of these strains during our enrichment do this TACMAN based method, and we can determine which promoter for strain one <coughs> is driving XR, XDH, XK, et cetera, for all eight. I have color coded here with red being the strongest promoter, blue being the weakest promoter. Uh, what a typical result would look like, these are two replicates. And you can see for some genes, like XR, we get, in this particular sample, we get very good enrichment for a high strength promoter. So it's either red or orange. Uh, for tau, same thing. For others, we get enrichment for lower strength expression. So we can take these raw data, and then we can represent that as a heat map to compile. And I'm showing you two different uh, library experiments. One for a, a truncated pathway that only includes the first plasmid of XR, XDH, XK. So just those three, is there a question? Oh. Only those uh, upstream three enzymes. And then on the right is the full pathway, a library that has all eight genes. The top here is pre-enrichment. So we do this to see what our library bias looks like. You would expect, since there's five promoters, that each of these squares should be roughly at 20%. And you can see that that's, for the most case, uh, true, although there's a little bit of bias. Uh, but then after doing enrichment, you can get some strong preference for certain strength promoters. So in the case of this truncated pathway with only the three enzymes added, we get strong enrichment for medium strength, expression of XR, a little higher strength expression of XDH, and still also a little bit higher for XK. But uh, interestingly, uh, well, this surprised us first because as I showed in that earlier pipeline uh, slide, XR is the lowest KCAT over CAM. So we were expecting that to be enriched the strongest uh, instead of being medium strength. But when we did the full length, we actually see that it's different from the truncated, and we do get the highest enrichment for the first step, XR, then a little bit lower for XDH, and then still lower for XK, and very strong enrichment for one of the pentose phosphate uh, pathway enzyme, uh, tau, transalylase, which agrees with uh, some work in the literature that this is an enzyme that can be important for getting high flux through uh, the xylose utilization pathway. So we were interested in, in these results in that it showed us that how you build your library can have direct impact on what the landscape would, will be. If you only include the first three enzymes, you'll get a different landscape that might have a local optimum that doesn't allow you to get to the global optimum that you achieve with the full length pathway. To test that hypothesis uh, somewhat, we took individual strains from, from these library and then did a growth curve. And in purple, you can see a growth curve of our full length pathway that was enriched. And in green is our truncated pathway. So our full length grows much better than our uh, 
much better than the truncate is. Optimizing uh, does a little bit better than simply expressing each of the genes with our strongest promoter, TDH3 promoter. Uh, but I'd say they're, they're comparable. It's not a huge, huge advantage. Uh, that's also similarly the case for the truncated. It does a little better than the all TDH3 for just these three genes. So next we did a shotgun proteomics to see uh, if we are actually getting the amount of protein that we expect from these promoters. And you can see that for XR, it is the case that going from medium strength to high strength promoter, we do see the expected dramatic increase. Purple bar for the full length is much higher TDH3 promoter than the truncated green. And similarly, we see the expected change from going from the reverse RPL18B, which is medium strength for the full length, to high for the XTH. But we also, oops, we also see that some of our uh, pentosphosphate pathway enzymes are not being expressed very well, even when we have the strongest promoter driving each of these. And I should have said that each of these genes we're expressing from Sheffermyces stipidus, their, their version, with the rationale that we figured that is a good xylose utilizing strain. So if there was any allosteric regulation or uh, any feedback, that that would be less likely in the stipidus version. And that works quite well with the transalkylase, expresses quite well. And then now uh, we didn't actually notice this in the literature, but Yang Su had shown that the stipidus does much bet, gives much better flux in cerevisiae for tau than cerevisiae does. So uh, we are fortunate in that. But for these other three, uh, it's poor expression, especially for TKL and RPE. So that's actually something we're doing right now, uh, expressing cerevisiae versions of these enzymes. And for TKL, at least, we've been seeing positive effects for adding more activity of this enzyme in. So uh, the, the next experiment we did was trying this under anaerobic conditions. So in this case, we're flushing the media to be completely anaerobic uh, because we figured this would mimic what the final fermenter condition uh, would look like more than our previous aerobic growth conditions. And we redid our library enriching under these conditions. And that you can see the growth curve here in light purple. That's to compare with what we enriched under aerobic conditions in dark purple. And our just simply putting the strongest promoter in front of each of these eight genes is in black here, or gray. And then the truncated pathway is, again, in green. So under anaerobic conditions, it seems even more important to do these enrichments. But simply expressing an arbitrarily high expression level is clearly not the best solution. And having just the first three enzymes is also not the best solution, at least in this laboratory strain, DUI strain. Again, with 2% xylose in a synthetic media. So we, can, we see dramatic increases in growth. We see a little bit better consumption of xylose, uh, a little bit better ethanol production. But we also see some xylitol being produced, which is a loss of carbon. So we're disappointed in seeing that. Assumably, it's, it's increased amount of flux. It's more xylitol uh, being made. And we're losing some of that through secretion. So we went back to the pathway. And one of the commonly uh, held views of the field is that xylitol is produced because of a cofactor imbalance uh, between these first two steps. The first enzyme, this XR, uses NADPH preferentially. And then downstream, enzyme uses NAD plus. So this is a problem that has been looked at by many labs, including uh, Wei and Zhao uh, here. Uh, we decided to, at the time, because it was easy for us to synthesize, uh, use a mutant version of XDH that was described by the Watonomy group that now uses, instead of NAD plus, it uses NADP plus with the rationale that now the, the pathway should be balanced. 
So we again put that into this combinatorial library strategy because we were concerned that uh, previous work by Watanabe, when they put it in, he saw improvements, but perhaps those improvements were because he was changing the balance of activity of XR and XDH, which we have, as I showed earlier, have seen is a dramatically affects your flux through the pathway. So maybe the gains were not seen because of the cofactor, but it was seen because you were changing and making more optimal that balance of activity between XR and XDH. The only way to really address this is to again do a combinatorial approach with the selection so that you can pick out, let the selection tell you what the best expression combination uh, is. So we did that on, on the left here, again increasing promoter strength as you go up for each of the eight genes. You see very strong enrichment for many of these genes. The same basic pattern as what we see for the wild type uh, XDH. So it doesn't seem like the balance is that, that different. So then we did uh, the same growth curve experiment. You do see an improvement in growth, although modest. I mean, it's easier to see here. You see a little bit improvement comparing purple to green, if you believe that with those large air bars, but that's significant. <coughs> that was consumed. You do see, again, a little bit of xylitol reduction, but not dramatic, and a little bit, if you believe it, increase in ethanol. So maybe the cofactor balancing helps, but I wouldn't say it's a, it's a game changer. Uh, so I'm actually not quite sure what, uh, what the large problem is for the increase in xylitol, uh, but it doesn't appear to be simply the cofactor uh, based on this. Uh, so in summary for this part, uh, I think optimization of the full length pathway is, is definitely the way to go. Now I think this, this strategy is easy enough to, to do that, but it warrants just throwing the whole kitchen sink at, at the problem for your pathway. Uh, and merely overexpressing enzymes at some ad hoc expression level is also clearly not the way to go, particularly under anaerobic conditions, which we think is probably because anaerobic is much more stressful. So it's a bigger burden to having high expression of enzymes. It's not giving you a benefit, then you don't want to be expressing those higher levels. So it makes sense that that would be a more strict condition that you'd want to optimize for. But we uh, toiled with the question that if you don't have the advantage of the selection, which we have here for Xylo, what do you do then? So let's say you're making a product like a biofuel that doesn't have a color or a selectable phenotype. How do you get to that global maximum on your landscape? So we asked the question, could we use the modeling approach? And we, after trying a few, settled on uh, regression modeling to describe the production landscape. So again, you, let's say you have a two enzyme pathway and you can have a lot of issues with that two enzyme pathway, expression burden, side reactions of your intermediate toxicity or loss of that intermediate out of the cell. So let's just say we get this hypothetical landscape for this hypothetical two enzyme pathway. Uh, that looks like a bullseye as you vary expression level of each of your enzymes. Can we take a limited number of random selected points on this plot, measure them, and then use that to predict what the entire, use the linear regression modeling approach to predict what the entire landscape would look like. So we did this theoretical experiment at, uh, with our collaborators in the EECS department, Anil Aswani and Claire Tomlin, and we got the plot on the right. So you can see that it's not perfect. It messes up a lot of details of this bullseye. But if you're going to if you're going to pick three or four different points to to synthesize and test, this would be your first choice, and that obviously would be your best hit, and maybe some of these other high predicted expressors. 
So it's good enough to proceed, proceed on. So our Envision workflow for this strategy would be start with your pathway, make your combinatorial expression library with the standard set of promoters that I described earlier. Put that into your yeast. You get diverse phenotypes. Measure the phenotype for this small subset that's randomly chosen from your library. Genotype that with the track method I discussed earlier so you know what promoters are driving each of the genes. You know, uh, so you know, that, you know the phenotype of that strain. You know what the phenotype is from HPLC or what other analytical method you're using. Run that training set of that small percentage of samples through your regression model, which will now predict what your landscape would be and then synthesize those best predictions, test those, and hopefully close the circuit there. But if it's doing poorly or your landscape shows that you have holes that would be very informative, you could use that for another cycle and synthesize those as a further test. So for a test pathway, we want to challenge ourselves with a pathway we thought would be difficult. Uh, so we chose this pathway uh, for biosynthesis of veolcine, not, not uh, because the molecule is of any real interest commercially. Uh, it's proposed to be a, a jack of all trades. A, it's an anti-tumor, uh, anti-fungal a dye molecule. And I would say whenever you see all these different applications for a molecule, it probably means it's terrible at all of them. So it wasn't for any of those applications that we chose it. It was because it's highly branched. So Flux can go to four major products. It's also a nice feature of the pathway that I'll use later in my talk uh, is that these four major products are all colored and they're discernible colors. So this, this was nice for when we made our initial combinatorial library that we could see, yes, changing the promoter strength for each of these genes can impact what your final color is going to be, i.e., what combination of, of products are you making, bounce products. But we actually, from after this slide, we don't use color at all for, for the application. So you're probably seeing where I'm going with this. We can take uh, we can take our plate of, of colonies. We actually try to, we try to pick them before the color comes up and pick them naively. We pick 90 of these and then a few controls. And then we can genotype using that track method what promoter is driving each of these five genes. And then we measure on the HPLC how much of each of these four major products they're making. So I, I should say that when we first did this, uh, my graduate student took these data right before a beer hour. And then a typical, me as a professor went and had a beer while he was doing all the hard work. And when I came back, he pretty much had mapped out what the ideal uh, combination would be to make the veolcine product. So by eye, you could even start learning what the design rules were. So again, we want to do this with the regression modeling approach, and we want to do it for each of the four products. So can the modeling approach do that as well? So we then did a fresh 96 colonies with different genotypes, did the same approach, and asked what does the regression model predict the titers would be for each of these 96 strains, and then compare that to what we actually measure. And you can see that it does pretty well uh, for each of these. Uh, it does very poorly when you get to a very low amount, especially right here, which is the limited detection for HPLC. So it's not surprising that we do poorly there. But as you get to higher titers, it gets better. So our uh, eventual proof of principle then was to take our prediction and predict what would be the five highest producers for each of these four products. And then plot that in this radio plot where this in purple are five strains that are predicted to make the most veal scene. And you can see they make less of the other three. And then we do that for the other 
mystery products as well. And you can see some of these are quite good. They pretty much only make the product that you're predicting to the exclusion of the others. So I think uh, what this would be particularly good for is metagenomic analysis where you don't know the stoichiometry of your pathway. This, uh, this modeling approach would actually tell you what the stoichiometry is, predict where the flux should go uh, based on the training set. Uh, and again, no color is needed, no screenable phenotype other than being able to analytically measure on HPLC, GCMS, LCMS, et cetera, is required. So this is nice, and this is certainly the first approach we just now do in the lab whenever we start with a new pathway uh, to optimize. Uh, it becomes easier and easier now that, all, now that we have parts that are characterized. But we know that the cell doesn't just control their pathways through expression level alone. They also use spatial organization to solve many of these same, same problems. So this is another layer of control that we'd like to add to our pathways. Uh, so specifically, we like to move, uh, follow the trend of eukaryotic evolution and use their defining principle of having organelles. Can we compartmentalize our reactions into a lipid enclosed container so we don't have crosstalk with uh, other factors in the cell or milieu? And there's been some proof of concepts for uh, a few pathways for this recently. Uh, Chris Voigt in 2009 showed that he could target uh, you could target methyl, methyl halide synthesis into the vacuole because there's a naturally a high concentration of halides and uh, most of the SAM enzyme is located in the vacuole. So it could improve as tighter as I believe it was four to five fold by doing these reactions in the vacuole instead of the cytosol. More recently, uh, Greg Stephanopoulos shows that compartmentalizing in the entire fusel alcohol uh, synthetic pathway into mitochondria was beneficial by allowing uh, all the enzymes to be in the same compartment instead of having to cross through a membrane barrier to do the first reactions in the mitochondria and then the latter reactions in the cytosol. So we're motivated by, by these findings and we'd like to do uh, a complementary approach that instead of Instead of engineering the pathway to work in the organelle, we'd like to engineer in organelle to work as generalizable as possible for pathways. So for this, we chose uh, the peroxisome as our model organelle that we'd like to repurpose. So why the peroxisome instead of these other organelles? Uh, there's a few reasons, but the most important reason is because the peroxisome is not required by Saccharomyces cerevisiae for viability. This happens to be a strain that's expressing the VLC pathway, so that's why it, it's that dark purple. But the important thing to get from this is in a strain where we knocked out one of the proteins that's required for import of protein, happens to be PEC5. So this proxome has almost no protein in it, in its organelles. You can think of it as dead. The cells are completely viable. So the important thing is that there is a there are cells here on the bottom row. So that's the most important feature because we'd like to knock out its native function, native machinery, and replace it with our engineered pathways and uh, machinery. But another very important feature is the size of the organelle. So in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, you have an average of four proxomes per cell, and, although that varies from cell to cell. And the diameter is about one micron. But in other fungi, especially methanol utilizing fungi, like Pichia pastoris and Hansenula pyomorpha, these organelles can grow quite large, taking up greater than 70% of the cell volume. So we don't think we'd be cargo limited. I think we can uh, pack a lot of protein into these organelles especially if we move to one of these other fungi, 
both of these being industrial hosts that large-scale fermentation protocols are well understood. So overall, our aim for repurposing this organelle would be first to gain selective permeability through the membrane by targeting substrate transporters to, uh, to the proximal membrane. Ideally, we'd like to do this in a way that we can get many different transporters into that membrane at the same time, so we get multiple pathways going at once, or a pathway that requires cofactors, et cetera. We can get those cofactors inside and control which cofactors get in to the organelle. Compartmentalize a multi-enzyme model pathway. So in this case, it would be really nice if we could show that we can preferentially get our product P here by blocking branching of enzyme 3 by simply leaving enzyme 3 in the cytosol and only putting 1 and 2 in the peroxisome. And then ultimately increase the cargo capacity. So be able to get as much of these enzymes into the organelle as possible. And there, there's some hope in being able to do this in that this has happened several times in nature by different uh, wildly different organisms. My favorite example is the pathogen T. brucei that causes African sleeping sickness. This pathogen, only when it's in this part of the life cycle where it's in the human bloodstream, does it change the contents of its peroxisome. So instead of doing beta oxidation of fatty acids, which is norm its normal uh, function, it replaces these enzymes with the upstream seven glycolytic enzymes. And they have an alternate version of hexose kinase and phosphofructokinase that are not alphabetically regulated. The thought that it's for turbo flux through this, uh, through this upstream part of the pathway, and the lipid is used to contain the ATP so it can't get out, so you can keep that balance, uh, and also to, to uh, keep sequestered glucose 6-phosphate that these high concentrations would be toxic for the rest of the cell. So ultimately, one of the things we pitched to DOE as our, our dream final aim three is to use, uh, to use the proxen to make a synthetic glycosome that we could get higher flux uh, in, in yeast. Uh, plants and some filamentous fungi use the proxome to, as a glyoxisome for converting fat to sugar. So this is especially used in seedlings where they need the sugar <coughs> until they mature far enough to do photosynthesis. And then in penicillin, uh, since the, the last couple of steps are done in a peroxisome. So the peroxisome has been specialized in these different organisms for alternate functions. So hopefully we can mimic that at, at the bench and make strains that are uh, similarly repurposed for our pathways of interest. So in the first aim, we, we are reasonably uh, optimistic that we should be able to target membrane transporters that naturally reside in the plasma membrane and retarget it to the, then to the proximal membrane. Because a few years ago, Randy Shankman's lab has shown that, uh, that protein from the ER can get into the proxisome, saying that at least some lipid from proxisome originates in the ER. And since plasma membrane proteins originate in the ER as well, if we put a new address stamp on, on these uh, membrane-bound transporters, plasma membrane-bound transporters, we might be able to redirect it to the, the proxisome. So here we use a marker for uh, the proxisome, and then we use a transporter that's tagged with YFP, and then our our proxisome address tag, and you can see that they co-localize very nicely. And we've since done that for a number of different uh, transporters, actually including CDT, uh, EBI, that we're using for experiments that I don't think I'll have time to talk about here, but, uh, but as we said, we're able to get a number of different transporters into the proxisome. So this seems to work quite well. In our second aim, we'd like to uh, control the import of protein into the lumen of the proxisome. 
And here we are fortunate in that proxosomes are pretty unique and that they import protein in the folded state. So you can do post-translational modification and still get those proteins from the cytosol into the lumen of this organelle. There are actually two different address tags that are used. Uh, a front door that the vast majority of native proxosome lumen protein use, that's called PTS1, proxosome targeting sequence 1. And then a back door that only a handful, four in cerevisi, proteins use proxosome targeting sequence 2. For these experiments, we tethered RFP to the, the front door and, and YFP to the back door. And you can see, as you might expect, that the front door, the PTS1, is much more efficient. You can see the background is almost black. You just see the red punk tie. Uh, but for the PTS2 tag that not very many proteins use, it's much less efficient. You can see a lot of background fluorescence. We can actually dramatically improve the efficiency of this back door uh, by overexpressing these cargo machinery that are required for the import. And then also a kind of nice trick that we might use sometime in the future that you can knock out this cargo machinery that's required for the PTS1 tag, but leave the PTS2 cargo machinery. And that way you can knock out targeting of that vast majority of native protein that gets into the proxome, but maintain your ability to target anything tagged with the PTS2 tag, which you would, could tag your heterologous machinery. So for doing tests of whether we're able to compartmentalize not just enzymes, but also the metabolites that the enzymes produce, we needed a product that we could see, so something that was screenable. So again, we returned to our, our uh, favorite pathways, Vilcine pathway, at least part of the pathway, the first three enzymes, which are required to make a colored product of PDV, which is colored green. You can see that uh, without this last enzyme, you get normal white yeast cells. With the full pathway, you get green. So then we did an experiment to see can we sequester the metabolite that makes that uh, intermediate for the enzyme, so this intermediate, for the enzyme that converts that into the green product. And you can see comparing the last enzyme being in the proxome, you get what pretty much white. If you knock out the machinery that's required for importing that enzyme in so that all three enzymes are in the cytosol, you get green. So we use that to quantitate how good is our, our efficiency, how much protein can we hold in the peroxisome and still not see an appreciable amount of product. So it should say that we want to do this because we're very skeptical of any fluorescence measurements where you're looking at just a few pixels that are very intensely bright and compare that to diffuse fluorescence in the cytosol. We know that's a really bad measurement. We've seen cases where the majority is in the cytosol, but you get pretty much black background just because there's so much area that, that fluorescence can be spread across. So I think this is a much more sensitive assay of looking for color. We again use our five promoters that vary in expression level, and we look in the wild type strain that, uh, that is able to compartmentalize, and then the knockout where all three enzymes should be in the cytosol. So all in the cytosol look like this. So as you increase expression, you get more green. Pretty much saturates already at RNR2, like moderate levels expression. But when you compartmentalize, you're able to keep your strain pretty much white until test level and above. So it's actually pretty impressive to us that these one micron diameter uh, Organelles can compartmentalize this much, much protein. And we also wondered, well, so we wondered if we could make this still better. So now we have this assay of looking for color. Uh, my graduate student made MNK library for, uh, for I believe it was the six bases upstream, six amino acids upstream of the natural PTS1 tag. 
and then screened colonies for their starting out green color, and then look for colonies that were more white, more able to compartmentalize uh, this VOE enzyme required for color at high expression levels. So I think you can see by eye that you can get a pretty dramatic improvement from the starting, starting place to our best strain. And then he sequenced these, and it seems like the, the take home point is the more ch positive charges you have, the better the cargo import. <coughs> so he used that in a much better, I think, for us in microscopy assay, where we have a cell strain that either, ha either has or doesn't have a very specific protease, TEV protease, and we make a a ask reporter molecule that has RFP tethered to YFP with approximate targeting tag, either our original uh, native tag or our now improved tag, and then that linker has a TEV cleavable uh, site on it. And I think this is probably one of those cases where it's better on the computer screen, but I think you can see that there's much less background fluorescence for this panel with our improved tag than there is for the original tag. It's be much more cloudy fluorescence. We're obviously in the process of doing a western blot of this that will be much more quantitative, but I'm expecting it to be dramatic. Uh, usually when we see this much background fluorescence, that means there's more in the cytosol than there is in the proxen. We see very little of that here. And I think that's not so much making the proxen bigger and able to hold more protein. I actually think it's making the kinetics of import into the organelle faster. So you have less reactions happening uh, in that time between translation and import. So next we want to move towards compartmentalizing this, uh, this small pathway. <coughs> so again, to remind you, we are able to uh, compartmentalize is actually our old tag. Now we can get compartmentalization all the way up to the strongest promoter. Uh, so you can see the difference here shows that we're able to sequester that intermediate so it's not able to fuse through the membrane. However, when we try to do the first en enzyme of the pathway, <coughs> VOA, that starts with tryptophan and then makes this IPA amine, which is about 200 Dalton, there we don't see any sequestration. So these small metabolites, and we've done this now for other uh, molecules, uh, we're actually using our CDT1 system for doing these experiments. We see that's reproducible, that very small molecules are able to pass through the membrane, but not bigger on the order of 400 or 500 thousand. So it seems to be some sieve action in the organelle. We think maybe there's a pore uh, that we need to knock out in order to make it an impermeable barrier. So we can take the, the last two enzymes uh, after, after we get the dimerization of the IPA amine. So it goes from 200 to 400 dollars. Those last two intermediates of the pathway are able to be sequestered. And you can see uh, here, if you have all three enzymes in the size, all you should get green. You should get white if you sequester either of the next two enzymes. And if you put both of those last two enzymes in the peroxidome, you should also be able to get green. So for medium expression, that's what we see. And for low expression, it actually looks like there might be some local effective concentration uh, effect where we actually get more production when we're in the organelle than when we're loose in the cytosol. But we only see that if we're at low expression regime, not high. Okay, so I think I'm running out of time. I want to be able to take questions. So I just want to acknowledge uh, for the modeling, again, uh, we collaborated with uh, Neil Aswani and Claire Tomlin in the EECS department at Berkeley. And for the proteomics, we collaborated with Dan Nomura in the nutrition department. And I'd like to thank, uh, most of all, uh, Energy Biosciences Institute for making uh, the project possible, especially uh, funding the entire first part of the, the story I told and uh, Department of Energy that's funding the proxism work and NSF for a project I didn't have a chance to talk about.
take any questions. The number of proxyl? Right. Yeah. In our BY strain, we actually haven't observed the increase in number with oleate, which we were disappointed by. Uh, but we are definitely thinking about that. We're using that same green white screen to and our combinatorial expression engineering to vary the expression level of all the known biogenesis genes and see if we can get either bigger or more. We should get some hits in that because it's been shown already that knocking out a single peroxone biogenesis gene will give you more and some other genes will give you bigger. And if you knock out a set of three, it was shown in one study, you get even more um, uh, bigger size proxosomes than the single alone. So if we do more on the order of eight, 12, we really should get at least as good as what those studies did. And that's definitely something we're thinking about. I actually do think that getting more proxosomes is going to be easier than getting big proxosomes. Because you'll be perturbing the machinery that, cle that segregates those organelles. And most, when we've done this in the past, is a quick, quick path. Usually the phenotype we get is just lots of little proxosomes. So I, I, that's definitely something we're thinking about. I think it is, should be feasible. How, how many, how big of an increase in number or size, I'm not sure about that. I don't know. We, we dream that we can make it look more like Hansenola pimorpha and be like 90% of the cell. I don't know if that's going to be possible, but we're going to we're going to try. Oh. Okay. Well, we definitely have glucose in ours, so maybe that's why. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we should try that. We haven't we haven't crossed those those projects. That's a great question. I, I forgot to, to say that for each of these experiments, after doing enrichments, we genotype what they are, then we resynthesize them de novo and transform them into a fresh strain. And then we test those side by side with the original enriched strain to see if there's any difference in their growth. So far, we have not seen for enrichments any adaptation, even though some of these are grown for a month, month and a half, of like 30 rounds of enrichment. Uh, we have seen enrichment when we uh, take our truncated pathway that's all driven by that strongest TDH3 promoter. We do see enrichment where the growth will start becoming much faster. And we think what that is is probably transalylase is being there's probably some mutation that's making transalylase be expressed at higher amount. That's at least our hypothesis. But for I've been surprised. For all of our enriched libraries, they seem very robust. Uh, we may every once in a while see the truncated pathway pick up an adaptation, but not for the full length. We've never seen so far a full, to the best of my knowledge, Liz, we've not seen a full length pathway enriched to uh, uh, a single gene type. It's usually obvious when you get enrichment because you'll start seeing the same strain genotype be taking over the whole culture, and it doesn't always make sense that that would be a, a good genotype. It would be something in the background that's giving it that, that advantage. So let's say you identify the best one and worst one, one medium. 
and it is selected from the UI strand background. Right. And what happens if you move it, you know, best, maybe a worse one is to a new strand background? Do you still expect that would be the best? No, definitely not. Uh, I think other than EBI, I've already shown that the, that short pathway does really well in their hands. I think the difference there is probably strain differences for the pencil phosphate pathway, that they have more copies of tau already in their background. Uh, I would expect it to be dramatically different, and that's why I would advocate always doing the approach of enriching. You already have the library, so just throw the library back into that new strain. It's actually a trivial experiment. We can get, we can pretty much get the results in a week if you can tell from track after about three or four rounds of enrichment, you can get a pretty good idea of the main features of what's going to give you the selective advantage. You might not fully optimize those intermediate expression levels, but you'll be able to tell which enzymes need to be at high levels. That will happen very quickly. Uh, so I would advocate just throwing that library you've already made into that new, new uh, host. So something, if we, I was doing this over again, instead of using oxytrophic markers, I would use antibiotic markers, so it would be easier just to throw into whatever strain um, that might not have that oxytrophy ready to go. But that, I would definitely just retest it. I think the take home is that it's fairly easy to, to retest, and that's, that's always the cleanest way. You don't want to be taking ad hoc guesses at what promoter might be the best. You don't want to take ad hoc guesses of which genes might have an impact. If you include the whole thing at all expression levels, just do that. The only time that becomes difficult is if you have too many genes to transform the whole library. So we can go up to eight very easily. I'd say we could probably go up to 10, and that'd be the limit. After that, I would start taking away promoters. Oh, uh, XDHB. Excuse me, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. And then you'll have to continue to go off with that. Are there different XDHBs as well? Because I know that there are multiple different types of XRBs done by different groups. It's been a long time for me, too. Yeah. <laughs> I believe there are, I believe there are quite a few, but I... Because I'm just wondering if that could have affected, but you're saying that, you know, there might have been some so we picked the latonomy at the time, which might have been flawed, uh, flawed logic, but th this was probably four years ago that we made this. We picked it because they had shown that they were able to get as much preference for the new cofactor substrate as the native had for the old. So it's still very specific, just switched. It's, it kind of came a little bit lower. That's why we 